Thank you. Um, so I got a mail from Ken, and um, he was telling me that I was going to speak um, virtually. And I was like, OK, I'm fine with that, since I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm kind of shy. I'm like, OK, cool. And then he sends me another mail that I'm going to be here in person. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, like so. I'm, I'm really fortunate to be here because um, so a couple of years back, I come from an IT background with no experience in cultural heritage and everything. And then a cousin walks up to me and like, he wants me to manage his art career. I'm like, sure, why not? Um, I'll give it a go. And so we started attending exhibitions, and it was fun. And I wanted to do more. And so I picked up a camera, and I went to my hometown, and I started taking pictures. And the experience was amazing. And so that's how I got into the cultural sector. And so yeah. Um, so that's my topic. Mm -hmm. Huh. Um, so I could basically talk about the tangibles. Tangible cultural heritage are things we can see, things we can feel, which you guys all know. You guys are more experienced than I am. Um, the intangibles, um, that's where the major problem lies on. Things that you can't see, things like folk tales, things like songs, things that you need to preserve more. and. Um, I'm glad they had this conference because um, people really thought about it, that it was needful to preserve the intangibles. And so um, I was excited to do some findings as concerning um, great art institutions over here because I come from Nigeria. And it was fun because um, I saw a couple of few, um, including here. And yeah. Last year, I was in the US for the first time. I got selected by the United States for its Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. And I was at Syracuse University, where I met Ken. And I attended, I went to the um, Eric Canal Museum. And it was really amazing to see how they preserved their cultural heritage. Like, that's the Syracuse stage, to see how they started and everything. And I was like, wow, like, that was really exciting. But it was more of an East Asian conference, so I needed to do some findings about East Asia. And so I read about this, and it was really amazing to think that um, this was even visible. Uh, I knew nothing about East Asia before the conference, and I learned about the Obang. My wife asked me if I asked if I had learned the pronunciation, but I was like, no. I'm not going to learn it. I want somebody here to tell me after that this is how it's pronounced, you know, cultural exchange, like sure. And so um, it talks about um, the different directions of life. It talks about the paintings, the symbolism, these five different colors here and what they mean and what they represent. And I was intrigued because I didn't know this even existed. And so I did some research and I actually discovered that there's a Korean center in Nigeria. And so it was a different state, but I went there because I wanted to experience the culture for myself. And then I found this amazing. Because um, from the previous slides, you could see those five different colors. You could see them reflect here and in the entire Korean um, ecology. And so it was really fascinating because um, it had so much cultural relations with my kingdom. Um, the colors, I, I, I asked the curator over there, like, okay, was there any real cultural exchange? And she actually showed me some videos of how the materials had symbolisms and how back then um, the kings from my area would travel over to Asia and most of our outfits are actually from Asia. And so it's quite fascinating. And, and so, um, can put this together, and I was like, I was going to ask you guys. So, um, how do you think you get, um, money was made back then? 
I know you, I know you guys don't want to say it. I know you want to say slavery, right? Yeah, that's cool. Okay, um, looking at all, the, all these ingredients over here, could you, all these products rather, could you tell me one ingredient that's common with everything there? One ingredient. Yeah. Let me categorize them for you. Uh -huh. Okay. Huh. <laughs> so back then um, we had in we had oil, and oil was like the major export because back then they used it for their steam engines and everything. And so um, this was how we made our money. Back then we would cultivate this, and um, back then we had. Like this is a picture taken by Jonathan Green. Um, he was a photographer back then, and um, you, you could see, um, how do I explain it? You could see um, this more like a factory where people come over and um, they get their oil. So back then, um, those palm oil trees over there, uh, they were in the hinterlands. And so they needed people who would stand as middlemen between the people who would come and buy the products and everything. And so. This led to, he was one of um, the middlemen. His name is King Jaja. This is actually where I'm from, Opobo. And so uh, he made so much money that he actually did found his own kingdom. He was a slave caught in captivity, but he couldn't rise to become king. So I was like, why not I have so much money? Why not I just find my own kingdom? And so, <laughs> you know, so he found out his own kingdom. And um, so um, in finding a new kingdom, like you, you basically don't have so much culture for yourself. And so um, from all the different places he has been to, like he took different cultures and he actually merged them together. And so um, that's my hometown. And so uh, you could see the masquerade there. Um, you could actually see the tangibles there. Well, you basically cannot see the intangibles there, the story behind the masquerades. And so um, I looked about it, I went around and I was taking pictures, and I was not understanding what I was actually photographing. And so I have an uncle who is a professor of African history, and I met him, I was like, what exactly that is? And because I could just see just a canoe, but he said it was a war canoe, that these war canoes were actually used in not just fighting war, but it signified family structures. And that was how they could say, oh, you belong to this family, you belong to this family. I was like, oh, these are actually good, um, intangible cultural heritage, but how do you preserve them? Because majority of our traditions are oral, and so the orality of our traditions are actually dying, because the historians are aging, and my generation, we don't care about this. We only care about just the aesthetics. Oh, the colors are beautiful, the colors are lovely, that's all we care about. But in the next 10, 20 years, when these historians pass on, like how do we preserve this? What do we tell the next generation? And so this got me inquisitive. I knew I had to do a lot. And so um, back then we had like different types of architecture, local architecture, but because of the cultural, cultural exchanges we had with, with the Western world, um, our buildings, we started going into Gothic architectural structures. And we had a lot of these buildings, but actually we had about 14, 15 of these buildings, but right now they're just down to seven. And so it's, it's really sad to see that we are losing a lot of these cultural heritages. And this is, it's called a deki. It's the house of a chief. It shows power and affluence. And, and so this is basically what it looks like, but the buildings are being neglected. They are being gone day after day. And so I sat at home one day and I got a call from my king. And he literally wanted me to create an exhibition. I'm like, I'm new to all this. He said, no, I know you can do it. And so I started traveling around and everything. So the first walking you can see there is the walking of King Jaja. And historically, he has never lost a war with that walking. And he's still standing till today. But 90% of people in my community don't know about it because nobody's documenting it, nobody's preserving it. And so after three grueling months, you could see the slide of me having a selfie. That was with my lovely wife over there. It was a bad day, but I was out in the field, so sorry. 
And so that is the current king. And so the exhibition was a success. It was at the height of COVID. I, I suggested the digital exhibition, but they didn't even understand what that is. So it got cut out of my budget. And so um, the exhibition was a real success because they saw the need to preserve culture and heritage. And so the king wanted to do something about it. And they decided that they were going to build a new museum. And um, I was happy about it, but sometimes I wasn't so happy about it because they actually destroyed the building I did my exhibition. And that building is over 100 years old. It's, um, it's the first ever court hall that was built in my kingdom. It has so much historic value, but it was destroyed just to build a museum that could be built anywhere. But apparently, the people in charge didn't know the reason to preserve this. And so I got some boats, I got some bond bricks, so that you know, future is equivalent to set up the place again. I could have something tangible. And so this is the new museum. And I'm supposed to be the cultural curator. I'm like, oh, yo, you guys. Like, so um, all this, I had so much data with me. I had so much content in me, and I needed to show it out there. And so I found it Silent Heritage, a systematic way of showcasing cultural heritages. And so far, so good. I've curated about four exhibitions. And, uh, and it's a lot. It's a lot because I had to, back in Nigeria, like nobody teaches you curatorial practices and the rest. So I had to learn everything myself. And so, but yeah, we're getting there. And so there was this saying from um, George. He's a Ghanaian. He said, African solutions, African problems. You know? It was in the early 1900s, they had a conference, and so they were like, oh, we Africans, we need to look out for ourselves and everything. But after my Mandela Fellowship at Syracuse like last summer, and I went back, I had a different saying to it. It said, African solutions to global problems. Now you could say, okay, you guys have invented everything, what are Africans going to invent and the rest and everything. And so last um, exhibition, last summer, rather, um, the Juneteenth um, celebrations, which happens once in a year. And so I was there and I gave a little lecture about, you could see that picture over there, you could depict slavery, right? But that was not the narrative. So basically what I was trying to tell was that women are trying to have their own pathway, but men are subjecting them to the fact that they have to be housewives. So they have a lot they want to do, they have a career, but Men are saying, oh, you need to stay at home and take care of the kids. And now, so we are literally moving the chains from our necks, and we actually put them in mind. So it now became like a mental slavery. So I was so fascinated that a lot of people who were celebrating Juneteenth, they didn't know anything about like, where they came from. So like, they're like, oh, Juneteenth, oh, celebration for blacks. But why? Do you know anything about your identity? And so it got me thinking that I needed to do more. And so I, I met Ken and he introduced me to photogrammetry, and it blew me away. I had never seen, like, I used an app called Polycam, and I did a 3D model, like, okay, this is good. And so I started experimenting, and um, I'm not eating a lot of your time. Well, it's your fault, you made me speak. And yeah, so I, I had a little bit of um, how I would go about digitizing cultural heritage by 2D, by having like a video documentary, art exhibitions, documentary, actually photograph. But um, in terms of um, digital repository, which I'm more keen into, um, there's, you know, the, the, the issue about documenting in Africa, it's not about how you want to document in Africa, but it's about understanding how the people want you to preserve their cultural heritage. And so most people, they, they, they come from an academic point of view where they're like, oh, we should preserve this, or oh, we could preserve that. It's just like um, at the British Museum currently, you know, they have a lot of artworks there which are from Africa. And now they're saying, oh, we want those works back. And now you have a lot of works from Africa, but you don't really know how to curate those works because you don't have Africans who are actually working there as in who people who have had the experience. And so that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin has to do with the people themselves. Like how do they assess these materials, like how do they go about, how is it being preserved for them to even have access to it? And so I, well, I know you guys know this already, so 
it's not like a big deal here. And it's a big deal to me because I learned this like some couple of days ago because I never knew that we actually cared about how we wanted it preserved. But thanks to this conference, so thank you guys. Um, I think my last slide is, a, it's about um, how I want to go about the digestion process. So um, I actually took a program with um, um, the British Library on Endangered Archive Programs, where they taught me how to digitize, and it was a very good experience for me. And so I'm, I'm here not because I want to speak, or not because I'm eating more of slime, but I'm here because I want to learn. I want to know how I could digitize and preserve my cultural heritage even more so that there are other local communities there that they need the same knowledge, but there's nobody actually taking out their time to do it. So um, I've sent all of them a bunch of messages, a bunch. I've gotten some replies, and um, I, I, I hopefully I don't need to send you guys a bunch of messages. I will just walk up to you and say, how do you do this, or how do you do that? And, and so uh, I think this is where I take my leave and allow Ken to talk about the second part of it. So thank you. It's a tough act to follow, y'all. Nah. I mean, really. Uh, so this is me. And, uh, you know, I've learned quite a bit already. Uh, just from being around uh, my esteemed colleagues and hearing the presentations, something that grabbed me was um, one of the things I've learned is healing what's broken and making it dance. Perhaps most importantly, be inclusive and be prepared for the unexpected. Sounds exciting. I'm into it. I'm into it. So when Gabriel, when, uh, when Belgam was really talking about African solutions uh, to global problems, it made me think about the time I've been spending uh, on the continent since about 2000, uh, working with various organizations. And the innovation that happens is just astounding. You know, the cell phone-based banking, probably, in my opinion, everybody been to this museum yet, the Zeitz Mocha in Cape Town? Wow. It's the most beautiful museum I've personally ever been to. I mean, the Hermitage, meh. This place, amazing. That's just me, really amazing. And technology is being used in all kinds of exciting ways. If this will play here, let's see. Maybe, maybe not. So, video's not playing, but that's all right, we'll move on. Uh, there's an organization called Drones for Good Africa, and they're using drones to highlight inequity uh, that's happening across the continent and to foster understanding about ecology. Really amazing, amazing stuff. Uh, in Kenya, there's an organization called African Digital Heritage based out of Nairobi. And they're preserving some amazing heritage over there. Over the years, I've worked in Liberia, mostly working in journalism and press freedom and uh, leading groups of students working with people fighting against the man, mostly, and uh, during Ebola, working with the government, and more recently in South Africa uh, during the pandemic, working with uh, video portals, live video portals between high schools and universities in South Africa and Syracuse, New York, so people can not be so sad, because that was, that was rough, y'all. I don't need to tell you that. So we've led a lot of different groups, but really, the question is, why do I care? Why am I here? And the real reason is this guy. We met last summer, and I thought, all right, photographer, cool, Nigeria, awesome, cool guy. What can we get done together? And uh, the Washington Mandela Fellowship uh, is amazing. Um, Young Afghan Leadership Initiative i uh, been doing communication stuff there. There's a workshop in the summer, and I got to meet Belgam, and uh, we just started thinking about what could we do in this area of digital cultural heritage and preservation. Now, we're all familiar, probably, I'm sure, with the work of SciArc and the amazing things they have done in Nigeria. And I think that's awesome. 
I mean, you can't beat it. It's just a high-end, wonderful, amazing work. But we have our own goals and initiatives. And so, you know, we want to be able to work on large-scale models using high-resolution cameras and, uh, you know, great applications like Reality Capture. But how can we expand this collection and make it more accessible is one of the things that I'm interested in that we're trying to suss out. It's probably not buying an $80,000 laser scanner. That probably might not be a part of our plan. Be lovely, if anybody has one, they want to loan it out, you know, we'd still, we'd use it. But we're thinking about the democratization of cultural heritage stories. And I started thinking about this over the summer. My wife works at Hendrix Chapel at Syracuse University. And I walked in there and she had this box on her desk and I'm like, wow, what is that? That is cool. And she's like, oh, it was, they just found this in the back of a closet in a church and they just brought three of these back to the chapel. It's from 1910 and it holds these glass slides they would use to sing hymns with, you know, they'd project the words and pictures up on the wall. And I'm like, that is amazing. And I thought, can I scan that really quick? So. I'd started using Polycam a while back, or Reality Capture before that, and I thought, oh, let me uh, find a window and a recycling bin, and uh, let's put that box uh, on top of the recycling bin and do a scan, see what we can come up with, see, see how good it's getting, you know, how easy it's become. And sure enough, let's see here, if this plays, sure enough, Within you know one minute, I was able to create a complete 360 scan, great detail on top of the recycling bin, y'all. So that was great. We were, and it, it just made me think about how can we use this technology in a way that uh, makes it more accessible to more folks. And so this semester, I started a project in my class, uh, Critical Analysis of History Power art through photogrammetry. And my students worked here with uh, Kay Allen at, uh, at SU's museum. And uh, I was introduced to her uh, by Vanya Malloy, who's here at Chicago. And she started working with my students with these amazing artifacts and, you know, just capturing those on their phones and digging into the why, why do we have these artifacts? What's the history? Should we possess them at all? Where do they come from? So as a vehicle, basically, to help a deeper understanding of, of my students, which are all graphic design students. And so we were able to create these pretty nice models very quickly. Here we have this adorable bird from 400 BCE, approximately. And my favorite, everybody's favorite, because it's a dog, <laughs> right? <laughs> Everybody wanted to do the dog. I'm like, you can't all do the dog but he was adorable. And uh, we're able to really create some great stories and they're presenting those stories and their research papers based off those scans and augmented reality uh, through prototyping in Adobe Aero on, uh, on Monday, actually. So they're working on them right now. So our idea is to create this collaborative virtual museum, a meeting hall for Nigerians to share their personal and collective cultural heritage digitally. The idea is that different folks from different groups can come together and scan their own bits of heritage, share those pieces. A granddaughter that has been given some artifact by her grandparent can just scan it herself and upload it to a collective location. Teachers can use the same repository to teach. And different Nigerians can share their work, share their heritage through different collections. So we have partners in this. Some are startups here, like Nowhere is an organization that uh, is pretty exciting. It's a startup, and uh, they do some amazing work where they create virtual environments that include live video conferencing, so you can actually traverse 3D spaces uh, while you're being live video conferenced. and. Uh, it was started by one of my former students, my very first student uh, from 2008, actually. And so you have these virtual spaces where you can house photogrammetry models 
in a sky dome environment and have her conversations about the art. We're also working with Syracuse University uh, Art Museum, and they, they miss Vanya, so shout out. One of my former students works at the New York Times uh, Research and Development de Department, and so we're excited to work with them and all their amazing work that they're doing with uh, photogrammetry and spatial journalism in storytelling. But most of all, I'm really happy to work with this guy and see what we can get done together. Thank you very much. <laughs>